to keep the momentum going in our final panel for this afternoon, we have the panel titled Building a Successful Network. In this session, we will delve a little deeper into understanding the underlying causes of gender bias and the mechanisms that need to be put in place to mitigate this. May I invite our moderator and panelists for the session to please join me on stage. To moderate this discussion, we have Stephanie Shakshabal, founder and MD of Globally Connected Companies and chairperson of the Netherlands Business Council. Joining her are our distinguished panelists, Ellen Cross, head of legal at NOMAC, Huda Shaka, associate director at Arab Middle East, Claire Back, legal director at EMEA Power, and Anita Nori, CEO of Green Energy Solutions and Sustainability. Over to you. Well, thank you very much. It's a true honor and pleasure to be here today and to moderate this interesting panel discussion. Uh, a big thank you to CABC. Um, I had the pleasure to already meet with these wonderful women that are in this panel discussion. And I want to make today also a little bit personal because we are talking about building a strong network. Um, so, without further say, can I ask you to start, Ellen, with introducing yourself a little bit? Sure. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you all. My name's Ellen Cross. I'm the head of legal at NOMAC, which is a um, operator and maintainer of an aquapower development power plant throughout the world. Um, I've been in this role for two and a half years, and before that, six years at aquapower. Uh, you probably noticed my accent is a little bit odd. I'm from New Zealand. I had three years there working in um, construction. I then went to London and I worked in private practice and also in transport. I um, have three children, 10, 8 and 6. I am married to a equally as boring lawyer. He's very <laughs> nice but boring. Um, and it's very nice to see you all here today. Oh, thank you very much, Ellen. Huda. Um, so I'm uh, a Dubai born and bred person. So I came back in 2007 with a master's degree in chemistry and looking for a science job. Ended up working in the construction industry and got into the sustainable development, sustainability field in 2007 when it was all just kicking off. Um, I'm associate director at ARP, the uh, built environment consultancy. And thank you very much for mm -hmm. looking forward to being here today. Thank you so much for being here, Huda. Claire. Hi. I'm also a, a lawyer, so I'm a head of legal at Aquapower, at, well, Aquapower, at Emea Power. And <laughs> uh, we also um, develop renewable energy projects, but across Africa, Middle East, and Asia. Um, I've been in the role there since February this year, and uh, my, my role sort of focuses purely on, uh, on renewable and also um, in due course, uh, thermal power projects. Before that, I worked in the UK and London where I was focused on more high developmental infrastructure projects, but purely focusing on uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and before that, I worked with a, a large law firm in London, also focusing on uh, big infrastructure projects, mainly in the power sector. Um, so it, it, my, my interest has is, is moved into this with the clean energy, renewable energy sector. Um, and it's you know, fantastic to, to be here and also to be in this region. Well, thank you very much, Claire. We're happy that you're in the sector. <laughs> Anita. So, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Anita Nouri. I'm the CEO and founding um, member of Green Energy Solutions and Sustainability LLC in Dubai. And um, I have pioneered the first landfill gas to energy project in the UAE and in the Middle East. Uh, and we are generating power from the landfill gas and running our operation and uh, providing power to Dubai municipality and hopefully moving to the next stage which will be generating power to be connected to the Diwa grid. Um, I came to Dubai in 2008 with my uh, two children and my husband who uh, works with me and um, very nice, uh, very calm Syrian but it's, it's a, mostly calm Syrian and uh, we've uh, had many challenges and many opportunities and just being in this region 
coming from a construction background and being able to develop a renewable energy project when renewables was nowhere on the horizon at the time when we started is an interesting journey and I'm happy to see that there is a lot of development that's happening and a lot of things we talked about are actually taking place and I'm proud to be on this panel with these nice ladies and uh, look forward to a good discussion. Thank you, Anita. We're proud to have you here. Um, let's make it an interactive session. So we all know that we have Slido on the background. So any questions you might have during the panel discussion, please share with us so we can answer them also in the meantime. Anita, um, I remember that we met already like eight years ago. And within these eight years, you have managed to build an extremely strong network here in the clean energy sector. Could you tell us a little bit more about how you managed to do so? Well, for me, networking is uh, more building uh, family and uh, friendships and just being able to talk about what you do and getting ideas and sharing ideas with people is what networking is all about. And uh, when I first came here and we started to talk about uh, especially the waste management and waste management sector, not very many women involved in this. And uh, I took every opportunity that I could, especially through Clean Energy Business Council, who was a, a great support for me, uh, allowing me to speak and meet and um, just see the whole industry grow. Um, also, uh, being involved with a lot of schools. The schools and the education system here is, is definitely enabling young women to get into the um, uh, STEP programs and having uh, the last group that came to visit our site, uh, environmental engineers, where 15 of them were women and there was only one young man in the whole group, was incredible to me and it was really, um, it just, uh, was very empowering and it made me feel good to see so many young women involved in this sector uh, in engineering. So networking is is great, but it's it's uh, relationship building for me, and that's that's how I look at it. Relationship building, indeed. Um, Ellen, you moved from Aqua Power to Nomac not long ago, um, or two and a half years, I believe. Mm -hmm. Have you found um, your network valuable at Aquapower? Could you move your network into your new role at NOMAC? Yes, yeah, so I think you guys, if you were here in the panel before you met Miriam, Miriam's at Aquapower. So I used to be at that company level. They're the developers. They're seen as the kings. I moved across, and I felt up because I became head of legal, but it was very obvious to me quite early on that it was considered a downward move. Um, we do the operation and maintenance, so 20-year terms, we have 26 projects which are renewable across the globe. Um, I have always been a person where I felt I can be in a room, I don't necessarily know everyone, or I have uh, confidence or expertise knowledge, but my mother always said, you can be anything you want to be, and you have a place in the room, provided you've worked at it. So I used to go to all of these things, and I remember my first week at Aquapower, I had just arrived from the UK and it was in Jordan. So I was, there was a breakfast buffet, we were walking along and there was a very nice man who was helping me cut honey and we started talking about honey and I talked to him about New Zealand and Manuka honey and, and he, I said, oh gosh, do you, um, do you work for Aquapower? He said, oh yes, I'm Mr. Abunai and I'm the chairman. And I went, oh great, <laughs> it's typical New Zealand day, you know, always bumbles into things. But from then on, I have always had a relationship with him talking about honey and food and he asked me about New Zealand and it's little connections like that for me that make this networking so important. So you can have these very strategic networking events and I advise everyone to do that as well but I also say that it's these you know, making meaningful connections. And it doesn't matter what role you have. It doesn't matter where you are in an organization. You can go and speak to people about anything. So coming back to the question mm -hmm. was the relationships I formed at Aqua. I met EMOs, I had CEOs, I had CFOs that I might not have done very much for, but I always picked up a little bit of information. For example, my CEO was a real, he loved writing. And he always used to correct language and get a red, 
tip pen, and I always used to call him the headmaster because he'd always circle things. And from now on, so now at NOMAC, he does newsletters, and I photocopy the newsletter, and I correct his grammar, and I send it back to him every time. So I have that connection about little things, and it might not be anything about law, and to be honest, I don't think many people would be in a room and start talking about the legal regulations. It's just really not interesting. So you have to find little pieces of information that keep you going. And from NOMAC, I contact and I reach out to all of these people that I've had relationships with. We talk about rugby. I've got the honey debacle. I talk about grammar. You know, it's all these little things. And sometimes my job is not about legal at all. My job is about trying to manage people. And my CEO always says to me, how do you think we're going to do this, Ellen? And I for, for sure do not say, well, I'm going to analyze this and I'm going to send out, you know, the review the contract and send a letter. It's usually about who's involved. What do I know about them? I'm going to set up a meeting with them. I might talk about coffee for a bit, and then we'll talk about something else. So these small, what you could call really trivial bits of, and I would still call it networking, are key in this relationship that you create from, you know, I'll have it for eight years, and I'll probably have it ever more. Mm -hmm. So whilst the first move was difficult, I will always have these relationships where I can get an in just because I talk about sport or honey. So <laughs> it's the little connections Absolutely. that count. Yeah. Great. Well, Huda, you have been with Arup for 11 years and you started there as a consultant and you worked your way up to associate director. So this is very impressive. Could you tell us like, how did internal and external networking contribute to being so successful today? Thank you. Um, yes, it's a, it's a really good question. I don't think people pick up on the importance of networking enough. Mm -hmm. So uh, Arab is an um, international company headquartered in London. So I, I joined the Dubai office. Um, effectively, all the senior management decisions get, happen in London. So I had the challenge of internal networking within the Dubai office, but also with um, senior management in the London office. And really what that came down to is going up and, and talking to people and you know, having the confidence to ask for a meeting and go talk to the regional leader when I'm in London. And it was actually really useful because I'd go once a year and I'd only have like two days in the office. So I'd send out an email to 20 people and say, look, I'm here for these two days. Can I have a coffee with you? And just, we have a cafe downstairs in our London office and just sit in the cafe for the whole day, meeting after meeting. And because I was there for only a short period of time, people would actually make time to come see me. Mm -hmm. um, so it actually worked to my advantage being um, based in a, in a Dubai office as opposed to the London office. Um, externally, the... Um, Two things really helped me. I'm not, I mean, I started my career here in 2007, so they might not be the same two things that are relevant now. But um, LinkedIn was huge. Mm -hmm. I was probably one of the uh, kind of first users of LinkedIn at the time where nobody was oh, wow. really using it. Um, but it, was, it really helped me get my name and my thoughts and my opinions out there. I had something interesting to say. I had a story, but I wasn't invited to the dinners or the golf courses or the bars or, or, or. Mm -hmm. But actually, LinkedIn is quite an equalizing platform. People like what you say. They, they'll, they'll hear you out. Um, and the second one was that we had a... Um, and women's networking event, Connect Women Network, which we basically go out and um, have networking, you know, very informal evening um, gatherings with women, with our clients. And initially it was, it was all very kind of, it was laughed about, it was joked about, you know, what is this women networking thing? But actually it was really useful for somebody in her 20s um, not an engineer, not particularly senior, not a Western expert, mm -hmm. to go out and you know, send an invite to a client, meet a client. It's an opportunity to start that relationship. After that, it's up to me, but at least it's a door opener. And that was really helpful. Yeah, and, and today it still is. Yes. Yeah, we're here, here at the Women Networking event again. How were the little connection that Ellen talked about helped you in your networking? Huda. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I think it's, as you said, relationships. Um, and it, it could be on a topic of... Uh, uh, so I work in kind of sustainability, sustainable development, and people usually in the area are very passionate, and we have lots of stories to share. Mm -hmm. And so it's either a, a common passion professionally or actually people just interested with, uh, you know, how did you get in? I really like your experience. Or actually, I want to be... Uh, I'd really like to learn from you as a mentor. And ultimately, I think if you, if you do the right things for the right reasons, they come back and, and help you out. 
True, true. Claire, uh, you are involved in the development of renewable energy projects across multiple uh, continents. I believe it's Africa, Middle East and Asia. So that sounds to me like a, a huge challenge. So how have you gone about building um, such a strong network across continents? That's, um, I think I was very lucky in my early days that I, I worked for a large uh, law firm um, in London and through that I established a lot of contacts with different lawyers and uh, you know I've seen them throughout the course of my career and I think we'll all agree actually the clean energy sector is the, I think we'll agree that the clean energy sector is um, is like many other industries that you may be working in. It's, it's a small world. It's amazing who you continue to bump into time and time again throughout your career. So, you know, a lot of the, the lawyers that I used to work with back in London in the early days, you know, quite a few of them are actually now here in Dubai and I've managed to connect with them. Then they will connect me into their law firms. They'll connect me into other lawyers that I need to or should talk to in, in those organizations. So that's been fantastic. Um, one of the other issues, I think, as a, as a, as a lawyer working across such a, a, a broad range of jurisdictions is often finding legal counsel or even other um, specialists who can get, actually get involved in the, in the projects that we work in. And again, it's fantastic having a network um, that I've developed over the years and having people that I can talk to, to connect into, to recommend, you know, do they know a law firm in, in Mali or Burkina Faso or, or Zambia? Um, and, 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 you know, it's been incredibly useful that I've got people now that I can trust, I can go to, and I know that they will give me the best recommendation that they can of, of who, I should, who I should communicate with. So that's been very, that's been very useful. And, and I do rely a lot on my network to go back to people that I trust and I, and I respect um, to ask them their opinion on, on what should be done. I mean, equally, those people are also there from time to time. You know, in house lawyer, you have to deal with a lot of different subjects. Um, and often, you know, I'll need an extra pair of eyes or I'll need some specific advice or recommendations on things. And again, it's fantastic having that network that I can tap into, you know, just reaching out quickly to somebody and asking them if, um, you know, they can ask a, a, answer a question very quickly. So that's been useful. Um, then, equally, in terms of this small world aspect as well you know over the years you know as I've moved I've moved to a few different companies now um, and I find sometimes we'll be using the same contractors in a country that I hadn't put forward but then I've sort of seen emails going around and I've gone oh I recognize that person's name I'm gonna and I'll send them an email I'll, I'll reach out to that particular person just to maintain that contact um, and just so as well they know that they've got a familiar face on the other side of the table as well. And I think that really helps, you know, connecting businesses, making people realize that there's that continuity, that there's familiarity across, you know, across countries, uh, across companies. Um, I think that, that's really important mm -hmm. as well. So I think, uh, you know, it's those networks that we make in the early days which are very important and sort of managing to, to maintain that level of contact as well. And I think that's where LinkedIn has obviously been incredibly useful. It's much yes. easier these days to stay in touch with people and to reach it's out. It's true. Um, and and I, th I think, you know, it, it takes time to work on that network and, and to be in touch with people, but it's important, you know, to reach out. And quite often, you know, as people pass through Dubai, um, they're out here to, to client meetings, conferences and things like that as well, you know, trying to actually connect with people and making sure that you take that time to meet for a quick cup of coffee or have that conversation and what have you. I think it's, you know, it's maintaining a, a personal relationship with people in a business context as you go through that makes it much easier for them to come and talk to you and ask you for favours and also you to go and ask them for favours as well. So, yeah, yeah as I say, I've, I've, I've been lucky, but it's, it's about maintaining that network and sort of using it. As, Maintaining as networks along. are extremely mm -hmm. important and mm -hmm. luckily we have LinkedIn nowadays mm -hmm. that we can maintain our relationships because having personal relationships with everybody, it's simply not possible. Mm -hmm. um, Anita, there are so many networking events nowadays, also within the clean energy sector, more and more networking events are popping up. Uh, how do you select the right networking events to go to and, and when is an event a successful networking event for you? Okay, so 
uh, uh, good question, but before I get that, I just wanted to touch on something that Claire said. Mm -hmm. uh, the sector that we're in, especially in renewable energy, is quite a small family, and as renewables are moving from Europe towards this part of the world, and as it's growing in this part of the world, there is a lot of legislation and regulations that need to be put in place. So all the lawyers that were involved in that, in Europe, in Germany, in England, and everywhere, are now finding more opportunities in this part of the world. So I think that that's where you will bump into some friends from uh, the old days that you'll come into contact with, and bringing that knowledge here helps. And the fact that uh, it's such a, a small family group, really, like the energy, you bump into the same people all the time, and, and slowly you start to build your network like that. Mm -hmm. And which leads me into answering your question. I, um, uh, I don't, it's not that I choose the networking so much as I'm quite active on LinkedIn. I like to add things and add my comments. And then you hear about little events coming up, especially if there are events that are empowering women and empowering young women. I really like that because I think that um, uh, telling your story is an important part of uh, um, mentoring and networking. And just maybe that one person will get um, an idea and say, gee, you know, this lady did this and maybe I can do that. And whenever I have students especially come to the site and I explain what we're doing in renewables, even though landfill gas is the little silent renewable, it's the lowest hanging fruit on the renewable market, but this region being such a sunny desert has become a solar hub. I still talk about my little landfill gas <laughs> project, which is, um, you know, able to provide power to the grid. I tell them all, don't let the piece of paper in your degree define who you are. Find your passion, find something that you love, and then talk about it, and learn about it, and, and meet people, and, and uh, that's where networking is building friendships, and you find out something new from someone, and you never know where that can lead. You know, be the voice. Mm -hmm. Be part of the change that you want to see. Uh, it's really nice to talk about all the changes that are happening. Spinnies are now giving you cloth bags. But if you get that cloth bag and then you don't use it, and it ends up in the garbage pile and ends up in the landfill, it's just as bad, if not worse, than the plastic bag that's going to end up all ripped to pieces in the landfill. So. Um, creating a network and speaking and talking and getting your message out and having the different events that are uh, sponsored by law firms or sponsored by um, embassies. These are all important because you learn. I went to the one event at the Dutch embassy. It was really interesting. I met a lot of young people and young engineers from uh, Netherlands who had different technologies that they'd want to bring here and if I can help them and enable them then I've done something good so each small thing that you can do each um, support that you can give each young mind that you can activate is an important thing and all part of networking and what I love the most about it I couldn't agree more. I think also in the previous panel discussion, we were talking about role models. Yeah. So even if we can inspire uh, only a few people here in the room, like being a role model within the clean energy sector, that's already going to help women to enter the sector. Um, Ellen, if you are selecting networking events to go to, when is a networking event for you a success? Um, first of all, I... I used to be a little bit um, adverse to networking events. I felt them a little bit forced. And I felt that it's difficult, and I think there's a negative connotation about small talk. But as I've already told or spoken to you about today, for me, breaking the ice is one of the most interesting things I think you can do. So whilst I am not as a strategic networker as I probably should be, and I like the more informal events, for me, a, a, a um, successful uh, networking event is where I don't necessarily get to talk about my, my um, interest, a specific interest or my specific expertise, but it's learning something about someone else 
um, with mutual, with a mutual um, interest and mutual benefits involved. So I hear what Anita is saying, and I 100% agree. Sometimes for me, and probably because I come from a different sector, but I'm in the renewables. So coming from law, I just like learning about other people. And you know, we do the card swapping, and probably people look at my card and go, "Oh my goodness, head of legal," you know. Um, but I, I have a lot of interests, and I'm very passionate about talking to people about what they're interested in. And I'm a very good listener, and I, you know, I'm. I, I like being there for people. So for me, it's probably meeting different people from all sectors that I probably wouldn't have met in a day-to-day -day world. Um, and I like hearing different things about people. And again, you'll never know. You will never know who you meet. You'll get a card. I get cards from different people. And two years down the track, I think, oh, my gosh, this is this person I met. And it's an amazing thing. Um, you, you don't know where you're going to come across these people again in life. And a couple of, before I came here, I was reading up on a few things because I thought, oh, gosh, I better know a few things about networking. And I like statistics and hard facts and things like that. But I was reading that 85% of job um, placements are through networking. So it's not through applying and, and your CV being good enough. It's actually about who you know. And that's surprising in this day and age where really it should be about just going on paper. Um, so I think it's a really, really interesting and very important thing to do. And I think particularly, and I'm going to say very um, generally, it's a very generally, it's self-imposed bias that women sometimes put forward is that we are... Um, gender, uh, gender, what was the word? I, I did have to write it down. Uh, gendered modesty in using our connections to get leverage on where we want to go or something we want. And, and th again, that's self-imposed. I'm not um, saying that you know, this is absolutely the way it is. But I think as women, we need to be aware of that, that this is what sometimes we do, that we might not want to talk about how good we are or what we're interested in or anything um, you know, that we enjoy. But I think we need to do it. I think that 100% that this is something we need to do. And one other fact. I, because I read them, I have to tell you them. Um, and I have got it written down where they're from, by the way, if you want to question me afterwards. Um, there was one about how 84% of... Or, or no, was it this... It was about how board roles, uh, men on boards, are less likely to give it to a woman because they feel she doesn't bring networking and connections. And that was, a, that was done by the Harvard Business Review. And I found that extraordinary that you... Again, that you can't get there purely from what you have done and your experience in the past and your performance, but that it's about perceived perceptions. Um, so for me, I think what you need to do is get out there and, and be seen and discuss and enjoy. And, you know, whether it's about your field of interest, I mean, you have to be prepared to get uncomfortable. I think that's the key, because you're never going to know everything. You will certainly get into a conversation where you are not the expert. So if you can prepare to be uncomfortable, I think probably that's a really good place. Be prepared to be uncomfortable. Well, it's funny because we just got a question in. It says, for women who don't like to uh, talk shop or shop on sports, how do you overcome the old boys club and fit into the network? Like yeah. yeah, so again, I, I agree. It's not always about sport. I mean, I did sport, so I can do that. But I can actually <laughs> talk about anything in terms of... I like talking to people, I listen to them. So I don't always, I mean, I know I'm talking a lot now, apologies, I'm a New Zealander, I, I chat a lot. I like hearing my voice, We like probably. to hear you talking, <laughs> Ellen. But um, you, again, go down to the lowest level, talk about something of interest. It can be as trivial as, where did you last go on holiday? Oh, I like to go there. Hey, have you stayed at this place? Um, it could be about children. It doesn't have to be about children. It can be about, you know, what's your favorite coffee in Dubai? You see them drinking a cup of coffee. Oh, it's a Costa. It's not Starbucks. Oh, no, I never buy Starbucks. Oh, why is it? You know, you can have these really random conversations from nothing. Mm -hmm. So it really is the base, base level of human. It's basically being a human, isn't it? It's about relationships. And I think that comes back to networking, you know. We don't like um, surveys, you know, there's a big percentage of people, I think it's 85%, who would prefer to meet in person. 
than mm -hmm. send emails and to do things electronically, despite us being in an ele electronic age, which I think is so meaningful. And it means that as humans, we mm -hmm. want human touch and we want human interest. And that's what networking is. That is what networking yeah. is. Like, I'm, I'm glad you're already giving us so much advice, Ellen. Uh, Claire, um, if you could give advice to a young woman that is starting her business today, how would you advise her to network? And I think looking at anybody starting out in their profession, um, I would say just start, start networking from, from the get-go. You know, I think, um, I think we, when we look even at universities these days, you know, back in the day when I was at university, you, you made friends, you had a great time and you, and you moved on. It was a lot more difficult to stay in touch because we, didn't, we were just at the start of email. That's aging me, I know. And it might seem incredible to some people. Um, but it was a little bit more difficult to necessarily stay in touch with everybody from university. But, um, but I would say, you know, even nowadays, you know, the friends and things that you make at university, you never know where you're going to end up in life. So maintain those connections, maintain those contacts you know when when you start out in a business um, you know a junior lawyer a junior engineer a junior analyst or what, whatever it is when you meet people on transactions on on business when you're on a project make contacts with people of, of your own age group you know start going arranging to go out for coffee with those people because a it's good practice and b you're going to grow up with these people you never know who these people are going to be tomorrow you know they might be the future ceo or, or recruitment manager or what have you you know it's it's and i mean i don't mean to sound sort of callous or, or harsh about that but it is about you know just it just creating your network right from the start there's no magic to it it's not like you suddenly become of a certain age and you've got to go out and you've got to start network it doesn't work that way you know just just start it's just a, and it and it shouldn't be hard and it shouldn't be with it well not necessarily with an agenda you know these to me networking is about making friends in a business context you know some of the people I've met through networking events have, have actually become very good friends and, and we'll you know see each other sort of in other non-work situations but it, it's it's about it's about establishing and, and just starting early on. But at the mm -hmm. same time, I'd say you know don't limit it necessarily to your your peer group, your age groups. You know, don't be afraid to talk to other people, to chat, and, and just to get out there. And uh, you know, sort of an, an anecdote as well in terms of you know who you meet and, and who you can talk to at different events. You know, last year I was very lucky that I was at an iftar and I started chatting to a very bright young lady and having a good chat with her. She was a lovely person. Turned out that she was um, a paralegal but looking for a new position. I was looking for a paralegal at the time. It was absolute perfect timing. I would never have found her going through a recruitment agency or anything like that. But it was just one of those serendipitous moments of, you know, two people sort of realizing, hey, you're a fantastic paralegal. I'd love you to come and work with me and she was looking for a new opportunity you never you never know who you're going to talk to and where that opportunity True. is going to lead you so you know start creating those connections reach out talk to people and and um, yeah start start early and what about you Huda what would be your advice the 85 percent of jobs through network or through relationships I'm surprised it's not 95%. <laughs> and that's not because I feel we're living in a corrupt world. I don't think it has anything to do with corruption. It's just, as you said, it's a, it's a lot easier to even ask somebody for an interview if you know somebody who knows them or has recommended them or have some sort of a connection. There's an, and it's, I think it's just human nature. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, yeah, I completely see the, the power of the network. My, my advice would be, I guess, very similar. The, the, the word networking might be intimidating. Think of it as... Um, you know, making friends, going out, talking to people. I would say do something every single week, whether it's, you know, uh, spending half an hour on some social media um, avenue, adding contacts or going to an event or writing an article, whatever it is, do so something, something very small every week. It could be going out and talking to your cousins who happen to be, you know, it can be within your very close family or friends. Those, those count, actually, those count a lot. So yes, do something every week, do it consistently. And some events will be worthwhile, others won't, that's fine. And you will gain something out of every event, even if it's just the confidence to go to the next one. Um, so yeah, go I strongly believe that you can get something out of every event and do something new every week. It's healthy. Anita, what would be your advice? Can you elaborate a little yeah, bit? Yeah, I just wanted to add to this. So networking is a word that we're using today because this uh, we're talking about networking. But networking just means 
uh, to put yourself out there and don't be shy and don't limit yourself. You could be sitting in a coffee shop with, uh, with someone and you hear the table beside you talk about something and then you think, oh, should I say something, should I not? Well, I tend to always say something. I, I'm out there, I don't, I'm not very shy. But don't limit yourself. Uh, don't be so shy sometimes. What's the worst thing that someone... Uh, can say to you if you ask they can the worst thing that you can hear is no and if you can turn their no into a maybe or let's meet or let's talk then you know you you've usually crashed your way through the wall I mean the the job that I do the work that I do I deal with government so I deal with Dubai municipality all the time and they're not easy uh, they're not uh, they're also not uh, difficult mm -hmm. they're they're learning it, everyone is learning and if you realize that there is no real uh, specific answer to anything and you can meet that challenge and help and teach and learn with them, then you really reach somewhere. You don't have to wear the hat of um, uh, I'm a, an engineer or I'm the one that's uh, leading this. Let them, you know, if you can allow, uh, and I'll, I'll use my marriage as an example, if you can allow your husband or wife to think that they made the decision, meanwhile they're making your decision, mm -hmm. then you win. You know, it's nothing wrong with that. You don't have to be the bully boss. You can you just open yourself up, talk to people. Um, be authentic. May, yeah, be authentic, be honest. If you don't know, say, I don't know. I'll look into it. I'll find out about it. But don't close doors mm -hmm. and uh, leave it uh, open. So networking events are good, but anything can be networking. What we're doing here now is networking. Everybody out here could have a question and we're all open to it and love to meet everybody because you never know what to, tomorrow will bring. And I never want to end anything with a, what if, what if I didn't say hello to this gentleman sitting in the front row? Maybe, you know, we can do something. Who knows what could happen? But I don't like to have what ifs in my life. And that's a big part of networking. Just, just dare to be out there, yeah. dare to show yourself, dare to say hello to the gentleman yes. and say hello back. <laughs> huh? Hello. <laughs> Uh, Ellen, can you elaborate a little bit? What would your advice be for a young woman that is starting her business today? Yeah, I think, look, all of these amazing ladies who I've met today have, have given you a lot of good advice, but I, again, I'm the basics. Back to basics. Never be afraid of talking to anyone, exactly as you guys have said. You may offer someone a different perspective on life. You might not be an expert at it, but it might be something really interesting for them. So don't downplay yourself. Always think that you might have something of interest. And again, um, going back to the networking events and what is networking. And again, I had to really do some research because I thought networking, that's a really modern term that we've got a whole connotation on and I'm not sure if I know that anymore. Mm -hmm. But it really is just communication, right? Again, it's this mutual, having a mutual benefit. And I think you can't go out there and believe it's transactional, okay? So I, I would recommend not going out there saying, right, I want this from you. It won't work that way. It has to be a two-way flow, right? You have to be open, hopefully they're open. It doesn't matter who it is, CEO, CFO, it could be a cleaner. I really think that we're all the same people. You have to treat people exactly the same, the same way you'd want to be treated. So hopefully you're having those relationships with other people who feel the same and you don't have to think, oh gosh, I'm going to have to you know, hide myself. But I have two women in my team um, and there's more and more women in our Dubai office now. I think when I started there were four and now we've got about 19. But um, I always try and give them access to senior management because I think that that is one thing that women don't automatically either push for or have is access to senior managers. So I always try and let them have that from a very early start. And I think that if you don't ask, you don't get. And again, you know, you get, um, you'll have more access to senior managers, you'll be able to chat on your own, you feel relaxed about it. Those types of interactions are also very important, as well as the lift interactions, as well as the coffee interactions. Mm -hmm. So don't be afraid of those don't interactions. Be afraid, no. <laughs> Huda, um, to build a strong network, one of the best things that um, you added, you said like it's also to organize your own networking events. Like um, I just got a question in, it says, my work always organizes outside events for things like rugby and cricket, <laughs> which I am not interested in. 
How do I improve my internal network? Could you elaborate? I'm not interested in either, so, <laughs> yeah, or you know, lots of other things. So that's a good point. Um, I think maybe suggest something different, and rather than complain and say, well, I don't like this, you can go out and say, actually, how about these three other things? Mm -hmm. um, whether it's you know a, a picnic with a family or whether it's a, it doesn't have to be a ladies' thing, but it can be. And I think go out and be proactive and organize something that you would want to go to. Chances are, half the office doesn't want to go to the rugby or the cricket anyway, but they're going. Um, so I think be, be the be the change and, and start start doing that. Good. Go to the events that you find interesting. It's part of being authentic. Um, and it's, I think you have. To, I think two two things. Um, when you asked about being kind of getting up and up, two things one of my directors told me th for different times that have made a huge difference in my career. Mm -hmm. One, he asked me when I was a you know, consultant, which director's role would you like? And I was blown away because I was just happy to be there. I wasn't sure if I was going to be there next year. And he saw me in the company 10 years ahead. The other question, the other thing he told me, which wasn't a question, it was a statement, as I was kind of becoming more senior, in my mind, I was in a kind of an international consulting firm. All the models the, I've seen before was kind of very Western expat. It's all about going to the dinners, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And he, he just said one statement without even me asking that took all of that away. Where he said, "I will not. I will never ask you to do something you're not comfortable with." And basically, he trusted me to do the senior role without going out of my, um, if you want, values comfort zone. And I think you have to be confident. I think uh, that you can have your career without having to compromise. And so organize the events you want, speak out, not in a complaining fashion, but in a positive way. Claire. Just can I add to that? I think um, the last panel also talking about unconscious bias. And I've got the alternative to what you were just saying. My male colleagues get invited to the rugby. They get invited to sporting events. I don't get invited. And actually, I, had a, I complained to my CFO recently that he was getting invitations to go to rugby matches and what have you, and nobody would ever invite me. So he made sure that actually I was invited along. And I think there's a, there's a bias amongst um, a lot of the, the, the marketing teams that they think only men are going to be interested in going and watching sporting events. I really enjoy watching rugby. Um, I probably don't get the rules and appreciate that side of it as much as the men, but I think it's a fantastic opportunity to go out, to be social, to be sort of in a, in a nice casual environment where you can chit chat about various things. So I would really say, you know, invite women to what you think might be typical male events and, and let's stop having this, uh, this bias against, um, you know, women aren't going to be interested in that, let's not invite them at all. Invite them, give them the choice to stay in yes or no, you know, don't make that decision for them. And so I clearly have a strong opinion. No, no, but like <laughs> no, you're but, right. Yeah. And all, also the other way around. Yeah. Ellen, you wanted Sorry, to say. Sorry, I was just going to say, um, sometimes I, I get a perception, particularly where I am, you know, there's very few women compared to many, many men. And you almost hear them groan when I am about to say, hey, but what about the ladies? And so I try and not make it a complaint. I try and make it, hey, let's, let's get everyone involved. Let's do it this way. So rather than it being an automatic groan because you're complaining, you make it more of a, hey, that's great, and can we do this? I think if you do a, hey, that's great, but... Yeah. It doesn't work. So, Ellen, I'm going to ask you another question. It's, it's one of the difficult ones. Um, it was asked by the audience in the previous session. Um, we, we all heard now today about the challenges that the women are facing in terms of um, um, in, a, in a male-dominated world, finding your place. But can you also use your gender as a, in, in a positive way in the working environment? Like, what are the advantages, actually? Yeah, um, I went to a top team effectiveness um, three-day seminar last year. It was very eye-opening. There was a lot of things I didn't like about it, but there was one thing I really liked about it. And the man said, every time you walk in a room, you create, and not just me personally, but as a woman and in this environment, you create almost a bias on yourself. People will listen to you. And I said, why do you... I said, no, 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 no. He goes, that is true. Because of what you're doing and where you are, you automatically create... Um, a torchlight in whatever respect on yourself and I thought about that for quite a long time and I thought I'm not quite sure if that's what I'd like because I've always been treated equally I've again come from New Zealand my mum said you can be anything you want to be and you stand up there and provided you've earned your place at the table you sit at that table so what I felt a little bit was wow that is um, not sure if I like that 
take on things, but I think it's a little bit right. Um, and I think that I do utilize it a little bit. I don't, I, I'm very happy being where I am as one of one, I think I was one of nine senior managers. I'm now two of 11, so that's better, slightly. Um, but I, I don't mind it at all. I'm very happy being in that position, but I can seem to um, utilize what I have. And whether it's a personality thing or whether it's being a woman, I would like to say it's personality and being able to talk to anyone and um, you know, having a joke about things before we start meetings. Because again, for me, being very dry the whole day is almost unbearable. <laughs> so I always have to create a little bit of humour and I think people are used to that. So I think they like that in a way. It doesn't have to be humour, but it's just injecting something else. And again... I'm expecting think, a joke now. Yeah, eh? yeah, sorry. Da, da, da. Um, <laughs> but I think the main thing for me is being human. Okay, That is the basis, again, of, of what I bring to the table. I, of course, bring, hopefully, my professionalism and my proper expertise in you know, legal, but I also hope that what I bring is just a bit of humanity to a you know, sometimes very, very... Um, arrogant sometimes, very charged meeting area. And I have been in meetings with um, Saudi Aramco where there's been 30 men and me and I was told to avert my eyes because I stared someone down too much because I was a lawyer and I said, well, I'm either in the meeting and representing my client or I'm not. So I can sit outside if you want, but it's not going to do us any good. So, you know, wow. I don't mind being tough at the same time. Um, and sometimes those meetings are like that. But then, you know, they fall back into something you can say a joke and mm. it'll calm down. But, yeah, maybe, maybe. Uh, okay, well, that's, that's an answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Anita, then I'm going to ask it to you. Uh, do you feel that your gender has, has been a significant positive or negative contributor to building your network here in the clean energy sector? Well, I tend to agree with my fellow panel member, um, and I'll tell you, in the beginning, when I first started, when I came uh, and started talking about uh, landfill gas to energy specifically, I think that my uh, gender played a role in they didn't, I don't want to say they didn't believe that we could do what we said, or but they didn't take it as seriously. So that in a way provided me a little opportunity, a little crack in the door that I could like push open. Um, of course, there had to be action behind my words and not just words or not just an idea. And I had to bring in my professionalism and a lot of, a lot of hard work and a lot of hours into it and actually um, made a success. But I think that in the beginning it did the fact that I was a woman in a completely foreign industry in something that didn't exist here, they thought it's, first of all, very strange that my husband worked for me. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that he's Arabic and he works for me was even stranger. Mm -hmm. And that we're saying something that they never believed could happen. All of those, uh, plus me being a woman, mm -hmm. uh, opened up a, an opportunity. Uh, in, now, I don't think so much as much, uh, and I think that um, uh, just doing the right job, having the right team with you, um, actually delivering on what you say and on promises, and uh, a little bit of a stubborn will, I think that's also part of being a woman. Um, <laughs> a stubborn will, yes. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so I, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't really like I don't really like to think that um, because I'm a woman or because it's a man, I don't, I don't like to put that label or that difference there. Does it exist? Yeah, it does. Is it diminishing? I, I hope so. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I don't let it rule my decisions and I don't let it rule my uh, path in Thank life. You. So yeah. I get two maybes here. Huda, like, uh, how would you answer that question? Has it um, contributed positively for you to be a woman within the clean energy sector? Um, so there is definitely the attention bit. So you, you stand out. You know, that's whether that's um, whether you like it or not, you're going to stand out if you're the only female in the room. And to me, I take that as a positive. Uh, obviously, you'll stand out the first time. The next time, you have to prove yourself. But at mm -hmm. least the first time, they remember you. 
you're, the, you know, you're not going to be the Ahmed or the Muhammad, the, you know, the 100 people. You're not going to be the John or the Peter. You know, this really, I can go by my first name in my company as well as in the industry. There's one Huda, really. And so, and, and not, not, and not, not, not to be arrogant, but that it, as a, it, it is standing out. So I would say overall, it's probably a positive. And then, you know, we have these kind of forums where you have the opportunity, where, and because it's, you know, it's not just about gender. There are, you know, ethnicities, et cetera, et cetera. And I think the gender diversity is probably the one that's furthest ahead. We're mm -hmm. not there yet, but we're further ahead. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Claire, I don't feel being female has had any impact really on my career. Um, I think, you know, of obvious things that, you know, you'll, you'll certainly stand out in a room full of men and that's, you know, the, the typical thing in the whole of my career, actually being always in, in roomfuls of men and, and looking for that other woman and, and very rarely finding them. Um, but I think, you know, really, I, f I feel that, you know, in my career, I've been judged on, on my ability and, and not for anything else. And I feel I've had exactly the same opportunities as the men. Um, you know, I've, I've worked in, in London for a lot of my career and, and perhaps I've benefited from that. It may be different in other parts of the world. Um, but no, I, I, I feel that really it hasn't, hasn't impacted in that respect on, on my work. So, yeah. Well, that's, that's great to hear. <laughs> um, so we're getting close to the end of this panel dis discussion. I only got two questions in, so I'm going to ask the ladies here and the gentlemen, to, do you have a question for this wonderful panel? Are there no questions? So I'm lucky, then I can ask all the questions in the end. Yes, oh, okay. Can we hear him? Assalamu Muhammad Abdul Hamid Man Masr. Yani, he is a very interesting and interesting and I have learned from myself. And I am not a Muhammad, but I am a Muhammad with you. But the Muhammad with the sisters, I don't think that the sisters are going to be able to do it. I don't think that the sisters are going to be able to do it. It's a لكن هو سؤال يعني هو لازم التقديم عن طريق مثلا اللي هو يعني بالنسبة للستات يعني على المعارف والأونلاين والحاجات دياتي ولا مش عارف يعني السؤال بالضبط بس عيد عيد السؤال بس لو سمحت اللي هو يعني التقديم للوظائف لازم عن طريق المعارف فعلا آه أوكي آه يعني لازم فعلا عن طريق المعارف ولا ممكن عن طريق الشخصية ال شخصية المتقدم يعني. ولا ده بنعاني منه يعني بنعاني منه في العالم العربي بس ولا برضو في دول أوروبا برضو التحيز ضد الستات يعني ولا في العالم العربي بس. شكرا لكم وصار جميع إلا وممتع جدا. أنا استفدت منكم شكرا. Okay, so we do have a we do have a translator. Do you want me to go ahead anyway? Just a little bit. Okay, the question is uh, in the Arab world, we might have bias in terms of recruitment for genders, like gender bias for men rather than women. So uh, for the social or for the network, do we still have the same problem like recruitment is based on networks or social, uh, like social connections, like favoritism or nepotism for people who know somebody rather than how he or she qualified or competent are. So, in the wider world, right? His question in the, was... In the Arab world, as he says, we are suffering from this phenomenon. How about for the global networks? Do we still have the same bias against swimming? And the, the second part of the question, do we have bias for unqualified people rather than or versus qualified persons for a job? Is Thank clear? you very much for the for the question, uh, Huda. Would you? So, if, if I understood the question correctly, the the question was a comment on the eighty five percent of of roles through networks as opposed to kind of applications. And personally, I guess my first comment is I don't see that necessarily as a problem. 
So I don't think it's a bad thing. It's, 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 just, saying, it's just encouraging everybody to have those networks. It's a bad thing if you don't have access to the network. But in and of itself, it's not really a challenge. But I guess the study was a global one, right? Yeah. So that, that, that study isn't in the Arab world. That's a global number. 85% of global jobs go through an, an, uh, are based on a network. So the question was, is it, kind of, is it the same elsewhere outside the Arab world? And I guess my, question, my answer would be yes, but I don't know. What yeah, and I think that there's a difference between, um, I think it's just making sure you're on the same playing field, right? So if you are all qualified for one job and you have 100 people who are qualified, so remember this is the key, you actually have to have the qualifications to start with. You're not getting chosen because you know someone who knows someone, which is nepotism you're getting chosen because out of that group of people who are qualified, someone knows that you're gonna be good at the job. And that's different. Because I think nepotism is, okay, you're someone's son who knows someone who doesn't even have a qualification particularly, but maybe they'll do a good job. And I think this is standing out. So this is like putting glitter on your picture. I have a daughter, she loves glitter. She loves to put borders with glitter on them and she doesn't really mind about what the picture is but I think the point is if everyone has to draw a picture and someone does a lovely glitter border you know th these are little differences that you can make very small but you might know me so we've met today I don't know many of you but you might see oh I know her I met her at this conference I didn't speak to her but she seemed okay and maybe I'll ask her what she does and that's okay, right? That's okay to have that introduction, to have a softness for someone, and to think, oh yeah, because she told me that she was in this O&M company, and she's a Kiwi, that's right, she's a New Zealander, and, and you have these things that you know about people. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think on the diversity side, which is this other question that you were saying, I mean, you know, I come from a Saudi developer, and we are now international, but we have very, very limited opportunities for people working at the plant, and in Oman, for example. And, and it's very biased in a way, but sometimes you can't help that. I mean, we'll do all we can to change the diversity, but it is difficult. But I think people are now, at least they're acknowledging it, where it's now being done as a positive thing. We are going to be equal opportunity employers, and we're actually going to positively, probably positively, discriminate until we get critical mass. So until at such time as you get enough women up there as same as men, I think sometimes you do have to do positive discrimination to get women there. Now that's not to say, it's not to say they didn't earn their place, and I think that's really key. These women, whatever they do, have earned their place. And again, place at the table. If you earn your place at the table, stay at the table. Thank you, Ellen. Claire, would you like to add something? I, I, one of the things I just wanted to add to that was that there's this whole thing about conscious bias, un unconscious bias. Um, and I think, even in myself, I've actually noticed me doing it but the other way around, that sometimes I'll find that, you know, a, a few years ago I was looking at um, CVs for a legal, a legal assistant, and they were coming across my desk, and I, felt, I found that I was actually favoring the women more than the men because I felt I wanted to give them more of an opportunity. And actually what I wanted to do from them on was, and I suggested in my company that we do this as a policy, when we get CVs sent through to us, we should ask the, the, the recruitment agencies to, to gender neutralize them. So we do not know if we're looking at a male or a female. And that to me is the only way that we can actually achieve true equality in terms of who we're recruiting because somebody somewhere is going to have a bias, whether it's a bias towards a male or whether it's a bias towards a female let those people's CVs stand on their own um, and, and let's you know and I really I would really recommend anybody let's find out what happens when we do that do more women get across the table you know do the more women's CVs end up being really considered for a position and, and make it make it through or, or not mm -hmm. but I'd love to find out Okay. Yeah. Thank you for your comments and thank you for this interesting yeah. question yeah. is there anybody out there that has another question the lady over there. Hello. How do you all keep yourselves motivated when you know there's a glass ceiling perspective involved at higher levels of management? When there's a what, sorry? Glass ceiling. A glass ceiling. Glass ceiling, glass ceiling perspective involved? And what would you advise young professionals like me who consider you all as role models? 
Who would like to answer the question? I just, again, just because I'm now one of the very few senior managers in our company, and now that one person has made it, one person, you know there's no glass ceiling. I mean, for me, that is very clear. I've earned my place, I've worked my way up in a very, very tough environment, and I want to pull everyone I can up with me. That is so key, and I think part of this networking is part of mentoring and working out who can help you. And I did say it's not a unilateral targeted, but it's a mutual benefit. But there is benefits for me having young women like you coming up with me. It really are, you know. And I, I do all I can to pull people up with me. Um, and now that one person's there, there's a whole opening. And I would never call it a glass ceiling anymore. I think it's... It's definitely shattered. Yeah. It's shattered. I love to hear that, Ellen. Anita, could I'd you like contribute to, to this? Uh, yeah, I'd like to add a comment to you as well. That glass ceiling that you're talking about, you're placing that on yourself. People place their own glass ceiling. There should not be, there is no such a thing. It's, it's you and your uh, ambition and your determination. And uh, it, try it because we place barriers for ourselves, whether we're a young man or a young woman or whatever we're doing in whatever field we want to excel in, we're placing our own barriers by saying things like this. So we have to change the way that we think. Your idea about being able to look at an application and not know whether it's a girl or a boy, a man or a woman, is excellent. Mm -hmm. And the person that's applying should also know that they're applying without any gender, their gender neutral application. Mm -hmm. And this should be something that um, uh, absolutely, that I would, that was amazing, mm -hmm. would be great. So you can become what you dream of. Yeah. That is the advice of these ladies. Is there one more question from the room? Yes. Um, yeah, I was just pondering the commentary of the afternoon and just thinking about the next networks and the connections that I've made. And they tend to... I've improved over time if I've just trusted in the synchronicity of things that have happened and where I might have thought that I needed to be in a certain place to meet a certain person and I end up somehow in a different place and I meet somebody else and that connection is far more powerful than the other connection might, might have possibly been. Which is partly trust in feeling into where you are at the time and that you're in the right place but it's also trusting your intuition. So as women, I would imagine that you would uh, very much play more with your intuition. I don't know, I'm just asking the question. I think men are all usually coming from very much more of a, a mind place. And women are coming more from a heart place. So in that heart place, you can choose your options from a more intuitive place. I was just interested if anybody wanted to speak to that. Who wants to speak from the heart? Anita. <laughs> well, I, I think that you're correct, but I think that we should all learn from each other. So men should learn how to deal a little bit more from the heart, and women should learn to deal a little bit more from their brain, and somewhere we can uh, reach a common point together. Um, uh, you mentioned something about Saudi Arabia. The first time I went to Saudi Arabia on a, uh, to give a presentation to a government uh, in Riyadh, um, when I had to apply for my um, tour visa, I had to mention my husband. And when they stamped my visa, they wrote Anita Nouri, wife of Zach Nouri, unable to work. <laughs> Meanwhile, my husband was accompanying me to do the presentation. <laughs> so um, that has changed now, going to Saudi Arabia. I didn't have to do that this time. But I mean, things are changing. Things are changing in the world, in, in, in this region, and all over the world. And I think that what you said is correct, and it should a little bit, uh, I mean, it should equalize. I really believe that. 
And I liked what you said about, you know, you start in one place, but you might end up somewhere else. And mm. I think that's to do with fluidity. And I think that we should all be as fluid as we can in terms of where we start and where we end up. I mean, I did a commerce and law degree, and I always thought I'd be a business, I would just do business. I ended up doing law, I then went to the UK, I did transport, and I moved over time, and I'm in a place that I probably never thought I would be, in a Saudi-based power developer doing operations and maintenance uh, contracts for 20 years. And, you know, sometimes I really think, Ellen, what did you do? <laughs> and then other times I think, it's an amazing, amazing experience. And because I was open to it, and I felt fluid about what I was doing, and perhaps acted, maybe it was more intuition than strategic, this is what I want to do, maybe that helped me get here. So... Yeah, I think agility has got a lot to do with it as well. Experience, yeah. uh, agility over experience almost. Because yeah. if you're too fixated on your plan, mm. then you get X result. But if you're agile and you're able to play with your intuition in the process, I, then and I th incredible I agree. you find yourself. Yeah, and I think that point about agility is very important because I think that if you're very strategic and you have these steps that you want to do, the first trip or the first fail you kind of have to, you think, right, well, then I'm not going to get there. Instead, maybe you just are a bit more fluid and think around the box, right? And you think, well, okay, I'm not going to have to go in these moves to get here, but I might be able to do a bit of a, you know, different approach. So, yeah. It's never one way to get somewhere. No. Um, I'm going to take the last question from the room, which is, can you all give us the three top tips that you have during networking? What are your three tips that you're giving the audience if they are at a networking event or even within this room? I'm going to start with Anita, ending with Ellen. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Talk to everybody and be proud of what you've done. And That's three. Yes, I like it, Anita. Um, Claire. Yeah, I, I'd say, you know, find an authentic way for you to network. You know, you might not be a gregarious, out, out, you know, extrovert. I'm an introvert. Find a way that, that works for you and don't, and don't feel that you've got to be something that you're not. Um, I, I think I've only got two pieces of advice in that one. And another very practical thing that somebody actually suggested to me is when you're at networking events, um, you know, don't necessarily give the person your card. Ask them to give them, uh, the, mm. ask them to give you their card. Then you've got a reason to communicate. You can contact them. You know, then you can reach out and send that message. You know, connect with those people that you really want to connect to quickly after an event, because you know, two three days later, life gets in the way, and and that business card. And I hate to say it, I'm guilty as well. That business card might still be sitting on your desk in a month time. You haven't done anything with it. So a get the business card so you can reach out to people, and then actually do the follow-up. I think that's important. Thank you, Claire. Huda? Um, so two of my three are already said. <laughs> be authentic, absolutely, and then do the follow-up, definitely. And then the three, there is such a thing as training for networking. So I went on a really useful sales uh, training, which I had no, you know, I basically had an argument with my boss, why would you send me on a sales training? But actually, it was super useful. So there is an art to it. You can do it properly. You can learn to do it. Invest in that. Thank you. Um, okay, so I would always take cards. You were talking about asking for a card first, but I always would remember to take cards. Lesson of today, I didn't bring any cards, so that's bad, bad, bad me. <laughs> Number, cards. Yeah, good. Like Number two, don't always go up to the most person who's been flocked around. Go to the person who's standing by themselves and start up a conversation. You never know what you'll find. Life is like a box of chocolates, right? <laughs> Third one, um, always come with a joke, and I'm going to leave you with a joke just because it's my kid's favourite joke, and then you can go and tell it to people, and you can say, hey, this lady at this networking conference told me this one. So why do seagulls fly over the sea? Because if they flew over the bay, they'd be bagels. So, you know, just come up with a little point of interest. It's funny. It's Fantastic. Um, well, let me add to that, because I think it's, if, if you ask me personally, what are my tips, uh, it's there to dream big. Definitely, like there are no glass ceilings. We can be whatever we want ourselves to be. So dare to dream, but also dare to make mistakes. 
because if, if we're not making mistakes, we will not learn and we will not improve. So also when you are networking, don't be afraid to, to say something silly about sports or say something silly about a, a topic that you are not aware of. Just break the ice because you never know where it, where it leads to. And be yourself, be authentic, uh, Huda. I think it's, uh, it's the tip of the day. Be authentic as a woman within the clean energy sector. Um, let me take the opportunity to thank you for being here with us today. Let me thank you as well as an audience. Um, it was very inspirational. Uh, I was proud to moderate this interesting panel discussion. And I would like to ask the audience to give these ladies a very big hand. Thank you very much for a very insightful discussion.